Good morning. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Gadigal people of the Eora clan on whose land we stand today and pay my deep respects to their elders, past, present, and future. It doesn't matter how many times I see that video, and it's a fairly new one for us. It leaves me touched. Because if you'd have asked me 10 years ago, or if I myself had thought 10 years ago that I'd be standing on a stage in front of all of you, I'd have said, you have got to be kidding. There is no way. So I'm here today really to share just a little bit about my journey, about why I'm standing here today, and a little bit about Oz Harvest. And it's really interesting that I'm standing here in what is now the Star and Star City, because prior to starting Oz Harvest, my background is that I was an event producer. And I was I'm kind of going to start in the middle and then I'll go back to the end and then I'm going to share what I've learned over the last nine to ten years. But why I say it's interesting for me to be here in Star, in the Star, or what was Star City, is because I had an event production company and I was working from my garage at home. And I got a call one day and it said, would you like to tender for the opening of Star City? Now, I thought the person must have gone nuts because how did they even know that I was working? But anyway, the short story is that I won that tender. And so Star City and a lot of the opening events of Star City was where I found myself. So to find myself on this side of the stage and not at the back is quite interesting for me. But anyway... I'd like to apologize from the beginning for my speech impediment. You might have noticed that I was born in South Africa. <laughs> but I was, I was actually, I was born to really, really, really good parents and a wonderful family. And I say that because over the last nine years, I've had so many people come to me and ask me questions and tell me things and share their stories and ask me mine. And, and not long ago, I had somebody come to me and said, you are so lucky. You're so lucky because you started Oz Harvest. And I started thinking about luck. And I realized that I was really lucky to be born to wonderful parents. I was really lucky to be born to parents who had values, and I was really lucky to be born white in a country during an apartheid era that if you were not white, you were significantly unlucky, not to mention significantly discriminated against. But the point is, and the reason I mention luck and, and going back to that conversation, was I actually wasn't lucky to have started Oz Harvest, but I was lucky to have been born to the parents that I was born to. So I'm just really a very ordinary person who did not grow up and say when they were a little girl, one day I'm going to start a charity. Absolutely no way I was born, as I said, in South Africa during the apartheid era. And in fact, in hindsight, I actually realized that one of my food distribution genes must have come when I was a child, because when I was six, my dad was involved in a very, very serious accident. And they didn't think he'd survive. He did, but he was in hospital for two years, and my mum who had to readjust her life to the fact that her husband was now in hospital and she had three children to look after. Apart from all the other things she did, from d selling encyclopedias and d selling wallpaper, one of the things she did was she baked 100 cakes a day in our home 
on a home mix master, and then those cakes had to be delivered out. And somebody had to go with her, and I was the youngest, and I was the person who had to schlep along with her, and I do have to tell you that I did not do it so graciously. So in hindsight, will somebody please forgive me for being a spoiled brat then? But the point is that clearly when I think about food distribution, I remember packing those cakes in the back of a van in, my, in her car and my mom had a shelf built in the back of her car so that we could put two layers. But the point is I didn't grow up ever thinking that I was going to start a charity, but I grew up knowing that people should be treated equally and that the values about humankind were the most important things. And so when I finished school, I had the option of either staying in South Africa or leaving. And I think that then my thoughts were that if I stayed in South Africa, the chances were that I would land up in prison because in the early 60s, if you were an activist, then the chances were that you would get clamped down and put in prison, as many of my friends, my parents' friends did. Now, my parents were not courageous and bold, and you have to be courageous and bold to be an activist, but they did instill those values into me. And so I decided to leave South Africa when I finished school. And I went to university in Israel, and I guess I landed, I didn't land up, I lived on a kibbutz for many years, so once again, that whole concept of social values, living on a kibbutz is an extraordinary experience. For those of you, normally when I talk at an Australian audience, there's always a nod when I talk about kibbutz, because it seems like most Australians at some part of their lives volunteered or went via Israel somewhere at some time and spent maybe a few months or weeks volunteering on a kibbutz. But a kibbutz is a communal society where everybody works according to their ability and achieves according to their need. And I discovered after 10 years that that was an extraordinary life but was not one that I was very good at because it seems that I was an individualist and an entrepreneur, although I'd never even heard that word. But when I was buying clothes and bringing them back to sell to people on the kibbutz, I realized that perhaps this wasn't quite what socialism was all about. And that perhaps it would be better if I moved and lived, instead of changing that society, moved into somewhere that would work for me. And so, lived in the city for a little bit, and in Israel, I had my first florist. And when it came time to come to Australia over 25 years ago, I decided the only thing I wasn't going to do was have a florist. You work freaking hard, you, you go to the markets early in the morning, and at the end of the week, you're looking at your shelves, and everybody would say to me, oh, it's so beautiful to work in a florist. How gorgeous and lucky you are. And at the end of the week, you'd pick up, have any of you ever had flowers in your home that you haven't changed the water. Yeah, so imagine that multiplied by 100. Not only that, your flowers that you didn't sell, it was like taking $50 notes and putting them in the garbage bin. But anyway, it was wonderful and I loved it. And then came to Australia and the only thing I wasn't going to do was have a florist. Now I arrived here in January and having lived in Israel, festivals were very different. We didn't have some of the same festivals. We work on a traditional calendar and different festivals. And, and things like Christmas and those kinds of things were not so um, apparent in Israel. But I arrived at the end of January and thought, okay, got to find a job or got to think what I'm going to do. And the only ads I saw towards the end of ad January were florists. It was like the only thing, it was like florist, florist, florist. Anyway, about the second week, the early, early February, I took my first florist job because I had two kids. What I didn't know was there was a Valentine's Day and on the 15th of February I was fired. I was only 
hired because they needed more hands. Anyway, I landed up with three florists of my own and, and then gave up those and started working from my garage when I got that call um, to, to do the opening of Star City and figured before that she came to meet me, the marketing manager of the then-to-be Star City, I'd better move out of my garage into a warehouse, which I did and worked in Alexandria and built up a really nice business wasn't a business that made millions of dollars, and I'm only saying that not to sound like a wanker, but I've had so many people over the last nine years come to me and say, Ronnie, one day, I'm gonna do, when I've got enough money, I'm gonna do what you've done, because clearly I, they thought that either I'd been a bored housewife or a millionaire. I wasn't either. In fact, I worked for the first seven years of Oz Harvest full-time in my business while building Oz Harvest, and I've only been full-time with Oz Harvest in the last three years as, this, as the official CEO. But, um, so, I built up this really good business, loving passionately what I did, marking the unique moments in either the life of a business or an individual, and producing magnificent events. And trust me, my events were beautiful. I cannot tell you how many times I draped the ceiling of this hall and created extraordinary visionary delights. But about 11 or 12 years ago, I started wondering and thinking and asking myself, surely, surely I had not just been put on this earth to create magnificent moments in the lives of other people. Surely there had to be more to my life than putting on and doing wonderful special events. And I started wondering about what that could be and what my purpose was. And I started feeling that I needed to find what that could be. Now, during my business life, and I am sure each and every one of you have been to an event, and you've been into hotels, and you've been to buffets, and you've had parties yourself, and you've probably seen that there's often food left over at any of those events that you've been to or held yourself. Well, at my events, since I was representing my clients as abundantly successful and abundantly generous, one of the things that I always did at my events was make sure there was abundant food. I mean, I'm Jewish, ethnic, trust me, we don't like people to leave an event feeling hungry. I did not want a single person to ever leave one of my events and have to go to Macca's. <laughs> so my tables groaned, and every one of my events, it was known that there was magnificent food. And when I could, during my event life, when I could, I would make sure it didn't happen that often because the event might have started at three in the morning and my job might have finished at three at night and the food part might have ended at about 10 or 11. So it didn't happen that often that the end of food and the end of me worked in tandem. But when it did, I would take a tray or two or three of whatever was left over and on my way home, and I lived in the eastern suburbs, I would stop at one of the only agencies I knew, which was the Matthew Talbot home, which ironically is positioned right behind the Porsche, the Ferrari, and the Maserati dealers on William Street. And arriving at the Matthew Talbot home, you'd step over hundreds of men of all different shapes and sizes, and I'd step over and deliver some of this food. And it was fairly confronting. And so when I started thinking about what it was I could do, I knew that there was food left and there was food going to waste. And I knew that there were people in need. And I started thinking about perhaps if I could put those two things together, it might be a good thing. Well, it turns out that it has been. 
I guess, in November 2004 when we started. Our first van left an office, and I'll share that story with you shortly. But in that first month, we delivered the equivalent of 13,000 meals to six different charitable organizations, and I have to tell you, I pinched myself black and blue because there was a vehicle saying, rescuing food for the charities of Sydney. And last month, we delivered the equivalent of 520,000 meals to over 550 different charitable organizations. So we have grown somewhat. But, thank you. But I want to take you back to that journey of deciding that this is what my purpose was. I'm thinking about all these things about what I needed to do, and I wasn't quite galvanized into action yet. And so I decided to visit a friend in South Africa that I hadn't seen for years and years and years. I knew she'd been a change maker, an activist. She had stayed in South Africa. I didn't know the details. It's the kind of friend that it doesn't matter if you see once a year, once a day, or once in six months. When you connect, it's just the best connection. And so I thought I'd go to South Africa, visit my other sister in Israel, go away for a few days, and just think about what it was that I really should, could, might, would do. And when I arrived in South Africa, Selma Brody, my friend, said, come with me because we're going to go to Soweto to visit an AIDS clinic I've set up. And as I said, I didn't really know the extent of what she'd done. She's a radiologist. She's now in her late 80s. And every week she sends me emails about the things she's still doing and the extraordinary, extraordinary amount of impact she's made. And I said, awesome. I had never been to Soweto because when I left South Africa, it wasn't possible for white people to just visit Soweto. And for those of you who've never been to South Africa or who didn't see some of the shots in the World Cup and soccer and perhaps know anything about Soweto, Soweto, still to this day, even though it, it has clearly been improved significantly, is a shanty town. Houses built from corrugated iron, and it it's it's, has a seething population of now probably four to five million people. So Selma said, we're going to go and visit an AIDS clinic. And as we drove into Soweto, Selma said, very casually, under her breath, unassumingly, she said, oh, and by the way, I was responsible for electricity in Soweto. The hair stood up on my arms. And I thought to myself, what can it feel like to know that you've had that kind of impact on so many people? And by the time we got to the AIDS clinic, I decided that I would come back and I would start a food rescue organization because that's what I knew. My skills were that I knew there was food and I knew there were people in need. And I figured I'd never stop world hunger and I'd never change the face of poverty. But if I could connect and provide good food to people in need, it could be a good thing. And as I mentioned, we just delivered our 26 millionth meal from good food that would otherwise go to waste. However, I came back from South Africa like a woman possessed because now I knew what it was that I needed to do. I was going to start a food rescue organization. Okay, so I thought I have another sister who lives in America. I might just go and spend a week with her while I'm thinking about how I do this. I had to keep my business running and since I was in the special events industry, whenever I'd go and visit my sister who lives in LA, I would always go and visit event companies and see what they were doing, were we on trend, was I doing greater, better, bigger, and in fact, we were doing greater, bigger, better than LA, but anyway, those Americans out there didn't hear me say that. 
But the point is that I thought, all right, I'll go and visit her while I'm thinking about how I do this. And I'm a member of the International Special Events Society, and I go through the list and I think, I'll just choose a couple of businesses to visit while I'm there. And I go down the event industry booklet, and there's a company called City Harvest and Angel Harvest in this book. And I think, oh, I love that name. I'm going to visit them. And I start reading, and seriously, the hairs on my, I got goosebumps, because they were in the event book because it was a food rescue organization targeting event producers. So I called my sister, I said, I'm coming to, to see you tomorrow. And I started calling this company saying, I want to visit them so that I could find out and learn why reinvent the wheel if there was somebody doing what I wanted to do. And every time I called, I got, if you have food, leave us your number. But I couldn't get past that. So I called my sister, I said, I'm coming to LA. I'm coming tomorrow. I'm on a plane. I need you to find the founder of this organization so that I can meet them because this is what I'm going to do. Now my sister knows me. She said, okay, okay, I'll do that. You're coming tomorrow? Yep, I'm coming tomorrow. I get off the plane in LA and she, my sister meets me at the airport and she says, come, we're going. I said, no, 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 no. Did you find the founder? I've got to find out where they are. She said, D -d do you think we could go home first? I said, no, because I might have to fly somewhere else if that person is not Happen, does not happen to be in LA. Anyway, you know when the universe provides what you need, the universe seriously provides what you need. And of course that person was in LA. And I spent a week looking at what they'd done, checking out, sharing, and came back seriously like a woman possessed. And that's when my connections kicked in. Because I came back knowing exactly what I was going to do. I was going to start a food rescue organization. I was going to call it Oz Harvest in honor of the harvest program that I saw in New York. And I was a little bit like the Pied Piper. Because I think that if I ask each and every one of you, and I can't see you all so well, but I'm going to ask you this question. How many of you ever had your mum, your nan, uncle, aunt, somebody in your family when you were growing up, when you were growing up, say to you, Eat your food because there's someone starving somewhere. I'm seeing the nodding heads already. And so what I discovered was every single one of us know that good food should not go to waste. And so when I said what I'm going to do is start a food rescue organization, I was like the Pied Piper. Everybody said, what can we do to help? And that has been the journey ever since. So, I thought it would take me a month when I came back from LA. I thought, I know exactly what I need. I need an office, I need a telephone, and I knew that I didn't want to start it out of my little office because I wanted it to be separate from Ronnie Khan Event Designs. So I thought, it must be separate, so it's no good using it out of my office. I need an office, I need a telephone, and I need a van. And I thought, how easy is that going to be? I mean, one of the richest guys in Australia cares so much about Australian food. Of course he's going to give me money. And one of the richest people in Australia has the biggest trucking company. And why wouldn't he want to see all over his trucks rescuing food for those in need in Australia? And then I thought, and then there's the richest guy in Australia who and shopping centers and malls, and of course he'd want to support food rescue in Australia. So I'm still waiting for them to return my calls. <laughs> However, anyone else that I spoke to said, what can we do to help? And so it took a year from the time that I decided to start Oz Harvest to the time that first van left an office to rescue its first food. What I realized after I saw that it wasn't going to take a month, I realized that it didn't matter if it would take me till the end of my life to start this, that I had found what it was that I was meant to do. And so 
I was lucky that it just took a year. And what a journey the last 10 years has been. It's hard for me to believe, but this is our 10th year. So, how did it all happen and what have I learned along the way? So once I did realize that I needed to raise some money, I'd never raised money before. I'd only earned it and spent it significantly because that journey from looking for purpose to learning that money that does not buy us happiness is one that is a very important one. When I started realizing that I actually only had two ears, and even though I love earrings, even if I did 10 holes in each of my ears, I still couldn't wear many, 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 many pairs of earrings that every time I'd walk past a shop said, buy me. And that my mother had said to me from an early age that actually I only had two feet. Well, you wouldn't have thought so from the amount of shoes in my cupboard. And when we bought our very first house in 1988, and we managed to scrounge the deposit and knew that we probably only had, and you will laugh, we only had, which is an extraordinary amount of money, but we only had $160,000 to buy our first house. And every house I looked at, if only I had just had another 20, because the house I loved was 180 or 200. And then we moved on to our second house, and now we had $340,000 to buy. And it's a funny thing, but every house I wanted was really 450. If only I'd had 450. And so the truth is, I realized we always think we need more. And in fact, how many rooms can I be in at one time? And when I started realizing that and realizing that I wanted to look in the mirror and know what my legacy was and know what my purpose was, that's when I realized that I needed to do something that was bigger than me. And that's how Oz Harvest was born. But it was not born by me alone. There is no way that I could have done a single thing that I have done without extraordinary people around me, beside me, behind me, in front of me, and above me. And that's the extraordinary and phenomenal part about this journey is that I've learned I've learned that we are not alone and that I really, really do believe that each and every one of us has a role to play. And the other thing I've learned is that actually all we have is today. When I think about, well, let's take the most recent latest example of those hundreds of people who got onto that Malaysian air flight that morning, 380. Do you think when they left their homes that morning and said goodbye to their parents, their friends, their children, their cousins, do you think they said bye because I'm never going to see you again? Do you think that lovely young man, Thomas Keller, who two years ago was his 19th birthday, told his folks he was taking his new girlfriend to King's Cross that night. They were going to celebrate. Do you think he said to his mom, give me a kiss and a hug because I'm not going to return today? So the point is, each and every one of us actually only has right now. 
And if you are not living the exact life that you want to be living right now, I'm here to tell you, you don't actually have another opportunity, that this is it. And so you all have an opportunity to actually be the very, very best you can be in the way that you, only you know how to be. But every time I've had people over the last 10 years say to me, one day, one day I'll come and volunteer with you. One day I'm going to do what I love. And I'm very fortunate in a, in a, in a strange and weird way that I got that early. I got that understanding early because when my dad had his accident, that changed my parents' lives significantly. He had just gone into private practice as an architect and clearly, if he wasn't going to be able to wor work the partnership that he had just gone into did not stand up. And so when my parents' lives changed, my mom spent her life working for the day that she would retire. Now she was an incredibly positive, happy, magnificent human being and I'm incredibly blessed because it seems I had some of those genes in terms of the energy. And she she planned her life for the day that they would retire and then, so she scrimped and saved and worked for that day. And my mom died at 63 of cancer. And that was a huge lesson for me. She didn't feel compromised, she didn't complain, but what I learned was that actually we only have now that scrimping and saving for that day, that day doesn't come. The other exciting thing that I realized just about my parents was on the day that my dad died, many, many years later, so he outlived my mom, and yet he was the one who had a stiff leg, was actually disabled, but I didn't even realize that at his eulogy when I realized that here was a man who had, was actually a, a cripple, he had calip one straight leg, one leg in a caliper, He'd climb up ladders, he continued working as an architect. So I was incredibly blessed with that understanding that you have to just do whatever it is you can to do right here and right now. So there are a couple more things I want to share with you. And the one is that when I walked into the office this morning, my team, my GM said, oh, it's our annual report. In case any of you don't know or haven't seen our vans, our branding is yellow and black. And he said, and it's an open visual annual report. The point is that if you don't live and love and are passionate about your brand, the culture you're building, what it is that you do, I suggest you take another look at what it is you do and how you do it and how you can infuse and be the best leader you can be. We don't need titles. There's a wonderful phrase, be a leader without a title. Each and every one of us are leaders. Each and every one of us has to find what it is that makes their lives meaningful. And I'd like to share that when I say that I didn't do this by myself, and none of you need to do this by yourselves, this incredibly con incredible concept of connection, and I know that we're at a LinkedIn <coughs> conference, I mean, just the concept of being LinkedIn, but we are not alone. And in fact, this is, I'm about to give a promotion for LinkedIn, which I didn't, happened to me this week, and, and, and as the result, I'm going to Melbourne this afternoon. I'm just going to share that very quickly because I think it's funny. I didn't really understand the significance of LinkedIn. I haven't really understood it. I'm on LinkedIn, but I hadn't really even understood all those connections. But there's been a CEO of a major, one of the biggest companies in Australia that I've been wanting to meet. I'd met him once 
it was the wrong time in both of, our, of my business life in terms of asking for stuff for us harvest. And you know, you phone a PA and an EA and they are seriously the sphincter police. You can't get past anybody. So a week ago, a week ago, I'm getting all these LinkedIn things, LinkedIn, LinkedIn. I sometimes open them, sometimes I don't. I opened one. And I popped as a connecting person with that person who asked me to, I, this is going to sound like I'm an idiot at a LinkedIn conference. But the point is, you know what I mean. There was the connection. And there was this guy's name. So I thought, shit, what have I got to lose? So I sent him the thing, I'd love to connect with you. And this is 11.30 at night. And at 11.31, a thing came back saying, great. Can, he, not only did he accept my invitation, he said, yeah, it would be great to meet you. So I'm not slow to act. At 11.34, I said, well, when can I meet you? And I'm flying to Melbourne this afternoon to meet him. So that's pretty extraordinary. So if you weren't converts, and if I wasn't a convert, trust me, I am now. But actually, to go back to what I wanted to say, I want to, I want to end with a parable. But before I do, this is our annual report. Now, most people, when they look at annual reports, shudder. But imagine if your annual report looked like this, and it says, sure, you can all read it. And I didn't even make it this size so that people at the back of the room could see. But this is our annual report produced for us, of course, pro bono. But in it, it shares just a little bit about us. Every single dollar that's invested in Oz Harvest allows us to deliver two meals to people in need. But if that wasn't fabulous enough, and I think that's pretty fabulous because there's not a lot that you can invest one dollar in and know that two meals will be delivered. Imagine if you knew that every single dollar you invested in Oz Harvest could deliver $5.68 direct benefit to society, because that's what Bain & Co., and I'm sure you've all heard of Bain & Co., the international consulting firm, who recently just measured our, annual re our social return on investment and measured that every single dollar invested in Oz Harvest allows us to give back $5.68 immediately to society. So that's pretty cool. If any of you want to look at our annual report, it's on our website. But I want to end with just a little parable. And it's during the Depression, and a man has been without work for weeks. And another day, he goes off to try and get a job, and it's another day that he comes back. No luck, no job, no nothing. And his wife and three children are at home. And he's desperately walking home, thinking, how is he going to walk into that house again with no food and no future? And as he's walking, he looks down. And there on the ground, he finds a shiny silver dollar. And with that dollar, he runs to the bakery and buys as much bread as he can with half a dollar. And with the other half a dollar, he runs to the little flower seller on the corner and buys the biggest bunch of flowers he can buy. And he is so excited, he hops, skips, and jumps all the way home. And he arrives home, and he flings open the door, and there are his children, his three children and his wife, emaciated, hungry, and miserable standing there. And they see the bread, and they grab the bread, and they start tearing it apart and eating it. And then his wife lifts up her head and she sees the flowers. And she says, are you absolutely mad? You find some money and you go and spend it on flowers? What were you thinking? And he looks at her and he says, my dearest, the bread is in order for us to survive, but the flowers are to make it worthwhile. I hope each and every one of you finds what it is that makes your lives worthwhile. Thank you.